Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 110 of the Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour I'm going to be ranting away about political stuff, stuff I think is important to me, I think deserves your attention. If you have any reactions, you can contact me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com, and if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time and you can comment there or you can get the email address from there. I will just tell you that if you want an answer to your emails, um, please be sure to include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that in the subject line so that you know it's not spam. Okay, so with that, let's get to it. First off, I'm going to start, as I always like to when I can, with some good news. But what I've got here is several bits of good news. I'm going to just kind of run through them pretty quick. The first one is that the Boy Scouts of America have voted to allow gay scouts. The organization has eliminated sexual orientation as a criterion for membership. Now, this is only a partial victory because gay scout leaders are still banned, which raises the question of at just what age in the collective mind of the group's leaders, uh, gays turn from being innocent youths into sexual predators. But for the moment, we'll take what we can get. Uh, Second, on a different sort of good news, the self-aggrandizing, power-hungry, self-promoting Sheriff of Arizona, Joe Arapaio, has been found by U.S. District Court Judge Murray Snow to have violated the constitutional rights of Latino drivers in his pursuit of illegal immigration. Snow ordered him to stop using race or ancestry as a uh, factor in law enforcement decisions. And it's about time somebody started recognizing Arapeo for the bigot that he is. Uh, on third, Abercrombie and Fitch may be seeing some real pushback as the result of renewed attention to some comments made by its CEO, um, Ma- Mike Jeffries, in an interview back in 206. In that interview, he said, In every school, there are the cool kids and the not-so-cool kids. We go after the cool kids. He also said, a lot of people don't belong in our clothes. Uh, This came up again recently when Robin Lewis, the co-author of a book, The New Rules of Retail, said in an interview that Jeffries doesn't even want larger people shopping in the store. Now, Jeffries sneering dismissal of what let's just say, is an extremely large number of people, did not go over well. In response, he issued this laughable excuse of an apology. I'm going to quote it here. I sincerely regret that my choice of words was interpreted in a manner that has caused offense. You know those non-apology apologies where somebody says, I'm sorry if anyone was offended, trying to sound like you're apologizing when actually you don't admit you did anything wrong? This one does not even rise to that level. It's pathetic. The good news here is that it's possible that there has been some impact. U.S. sales fell 17% in the first quarter of the year, and future profit forecasts have been cut. Now, how much of this uh, is the result of anger over Jeffrey's culturally bigoted stupidity can actually be told, but you you figure there's probably at least a little. Oh, by the way, this is Mike Jeffries. And in case you're wondering, yes, he does dye his hair blonde. Why this guy is supposed to be an expert on what's cool mystifies me. All right, moving on. Pope Francis has declared that everyone was redeemed through the death of Jesus, including atheists. All he said of all faith and even of no faith can do good and have the duty to do good. I know why. Is this good news? Because it's a heck of a lot more open-minded than his predecessor ever would have been. Five, finally, it's appearing more and more that at least some American workers have finally just had enough. The latest one-day strike by low-wage workers, which took place on May 21st, wasn't by employees of Walmart or McDonald's. It was by people who work for contractors, which are hired by the federal government to provide staff at places like Union Station or the Smithsonian uh, Smithsonian Institutes in Washington, D.C. These guys, these folks, I should say, are among the nearly two million such people working for federal contractors around the country at near poverty wages, while their CEOs can legally be reimbursed by taxpayers up to somewhere around $760,000 a year. 
Strikers are calling on President Hopi Chenji to lift their wages, which he could do by executive order, but hasn't. All right, going on from there to uh, one of our regular weekly features, as if that wasn't enough of one, this is the outrage of the week. This week, it involves another assault on our privacy and another example of how corporate America wants to have more and more control over our personal lives. Various corporations are now demanding that employees meet certain health goals or be punished in some way. For example, CVS, this is one of the nation's largest pharmacy chains, it expects its workers to go to their doctor and have them determine their height, weight, body fat, blood pressure, other health indicators, and then allow that information to go not only to the insurance company, but also to another company which manages benefits on behalf of CVS. Now, CVS's health insurance plan will pay for this wellness review, as they're called, but the workers who don't take part in this supposedly voluntary program are going to be charged an extra $600 a year on their insurance premiums, which is a meaning of the word voluntary, of which I was previously unaware. Michelin North America is another example. Uh, the company plans to monitor employees' body mass indexes, blood pressure, glucose levels, triglycerides, and waist sizes. If your waist size is above 35 inches for a woman or 40 inches for a man, or if other metrics fall outside what the company says is the acceptable range, you're going to be hit with penalties that will cost you an extra $1,000 a year for your health care. Uh, by the way, no word on if Michelin is planning a change in its corporate logo. Uh, com other companies, other big companies, Walmart, Home Depot, other large companies are actually doing the same thing. But you've got to understand this is okay. It really is. It's okay. Because the corporations are, 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 are they're all these, they're claiming that this is being done for the benefit of their employees. Oh, no, it has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, cutting benefits. It's got nothing to do with increasing their profit margin. Ah, oh, perish the thought. In fact, Michelin claims the new policy, quote, helps us help our employees. Do it our way or pay an extra thousand dollars a year. See, see, see what we do for you? CVS is even worse. A corporate flack said, I'm quoting, Our benefits program is evolving to help our colleagues engage more actively to improve their health and manage health associated costs. The company even labeled this wellness review as done, quoting, so that colleagues know their key health metrics in order to take action to improve their overall health. It's all for you, don't you see? That's why it'll cost you 600 bucks a year if you don't go along with us. It's, it's for you. Oh, and by the way, just as a sidebar here, colleagues, I'm really sick of that corporate talk doublespeak. You know, we're all colleagues here. We're all team members here. So just for the fun of it, I looked up the word colleague in a thesaurus. This is what it said. Main entry, colleague, associate, fellow worker. Synonyms, aid, ally, buddy, chum, coworker, coadjutor, cohort, collaborator, companion, compatriot, comrade, confederate, confrere, crony, friend, helper, pal, partner, teammate, workmate. Now, where in that list can you stick in as a synonym for, uh, for colleague, bosses empowered to penalize you $600 a year if you don't do what they say? No matter what they tell you, your boss is not your colleague. And CVS also lied about its program, claiming that what it's doing is common practice. It based this on a survey from 2011, which said that 80% of large employers which offer health insurance or health coverage include a wellness review as part of those benefits. The problem is, a 2012 survey said that only 18% of companies actually tell their employees they're supposed to do this, and only half of those actually penalize people who don't. It is not common practice. On the other hand, it may become common practice. Obamacare specifically allows employers to penalize workers who don't participate in wellness programs with higher premiums or higher deductibles or both. And this actually also applies to some workers who don't meet certain health standards. As a result, another survey said that 6 in 10 employers are saying that they may institute a program like this of fining employees who don't meet certain health standards that the company sets. So, 
We have the invasion of privacy. We have the cold exercise of corporate power. We have the stigmatizing of people with, with health conditions as if every health condition was a matter of personal failure. Um, we have penalizing people who fail to meet arbitrary standards. We have the cutting of benefits. We have the lies. We have the bull about colleagues. And on top of all that, we have the fact that all of this is being done on behalf of programs that do not work. The RAND Corporation performed a study, congressionally mandated study, on behalf of the Departments of Labor and of Health and Human Services. And it found that these wellness programs, at best, produce modest benefits. The report found, for example, that people who participate in a program for weight loss lose an average of one pound a year for three years. Participation was not associated with significant reductions in total cholesterol level. Smoking cessation programs only work in the short term. Wellness programs did not catch warning signs of disease or prevent emergencies. No statistically significant decreases in the cost or use of emergency departments or hospitals was found. In fact, some experts who weren't involved in this study say that even the modest benefits that Rand found don't necessarily apply to the population as a whole. Most of these programs are now still voluntary, which generally means only the most motivated people are taking part in them. And this is not the only recent study to have found exactly this. Uh, earlier this year, researchers at the University of California, on behalf of the California State Senate, conducted an analysis of dozens of existing studies of workplace wellness programs. The group found that participating in work-based wellness programs does not lower blood pressure, does not lower blood sugar, does not lower cholesterol, and rarely leads to weight loss, and even where it does, it's often not sustained. A different study out of the University of Arizona also this year found no overall decrease in healthcare spending as a result of wellness programs. Now these wellness programs are fine when they're voluntary. They're fine just as a benefit you can offer your employees. It's not the programs themselves that are the blame. It's the absurd expectations placed on them uh, and the demands placed on employees by corporations who think that their soaring profits have not soared enough and never will. So offering a wellness program is fine, but demanding participation, slashing employee benefits, punishing those not willing to participate, and penalizing those who do not meet corporate-defined health standards, all while demanding our personal health information, get exposed to even more sets of prying eyes, all for something that doesn't even work? That's an outrage. Okay, something else now. Um, the Clown Award, our other regular feature, given regularly for acts of meritorious stupidity. This week, the Big Red Nose goes to the school board of Springboro, Ohio, a suburb about midway between Cincinnati and Dayton. In 2011, the board considered a proposal to allow teaching of creationism in the schools as supplemental instruction. The plan was dropped due to public opposition, but far be it from clowns to be deterred by reason. They're at it again. The board is currently considering a proposal that would allow the district, schools in the district, to teach creationism as part of a larger proposal about controversial issues in the classroom. Now, the parents who spoke at the board meeting about this are against it. The ACLU of Ohio points out that courts have repeatedly found creationism to be inherently religious, and so teaching it in schools is an unconstitutional violation of church-state separation. The board doesn't care. Three members of this five-member board are in favor of this proposal. One of them, actually, who is also the head of the local Tea Party, said creationism is, quote, a significant part of the history of this country and an absolutely valid theory. Another said, we're pointing out evolution is a controversial issue. Well, evolution, of course, is not controversial among scientists. It's only controversial among the yahoos and know-nothings who can't stop thumping their Bible long enough to understand what it is the heck they're talking about. Ohio, unfortunately, seems to have an overabundance of such people, at least among the clowns on the school board of Springboro, Ohio. Now, there's a footnote to this. Uh, the 2012 platform, the Texas GOP, in discussing education, says the party is opposed to, quote, critical thinking skills and similar programs. 
Now, leaving aside the observation that it's easy to understand why the right wing would be, would be against critical thinking, I wonder what this means for all of those various dodos who use the claim of improving critical thinking skills as a means to try to lever creationism into the schools. It's apparently a case of the right hand not knowing what the other right hand is doing. By the way, there actually is some good news on this front. Uh, as reported by the National Center for Science Education, two anti-evolution bills died in the Missouri State Senate on May 17th when the legislature adjourned. And one of those bills referred to, yes, helping students develop critical thinking skills by discussing creationism. In all, eight anti-evolution bills were introduced in six states in 2013. Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Missouri, Montana, and Oklahoma. None of them passed. Hooray. We are going to take a break. Here we are back again. I'm going to start now, the second half of the show, with a couple of updates. I've got two updates on things that I've talked about recently. Uh, The first is that the real Obama scandal of recent weeks, which was the Justice Department's investigation and surveillance of AP and Fox News, has led to a sustained wave of criticism of the administration's media policies. For example, last week, the Committee to Protect Journalists declared that the Department of Justice's secret subpoenas for the AP, quote, represent a damaging setback for press freedom in the United States. Over 50 media outlets signed a letter to the DOJ making the same argument. Washington Post columnist Dana Milbank referred to labeling Fox News reporter James Rosen as a co-conspirator in court papers. He referred to this as a flagrant assault on civil liberties. And even the New York Times got into the act. They charged in an editorial that the White House has moved beyond protecting government secrets to threatening fundamental freedoms of the press. So they are getting their pushback. Uh, One additional observation about this, though, is that this whole business points up, again, the amoral hypocrisy of the right wing. They've been screaming about the surveillance of James Rosen. Legitimately so. They've been screaming about that, but a few years ago, when New York Times reporter James Risen was being pursued in court, first by the Shrub team and then by the Obama gang, over a leak involving the massive secret surveillance of international communications by the National Security Agency and another leak about a botched intelligence operation in Iran, the parts of the right wing that didn't just stand silent in the face of this were actually out there saying that the New York Times should have been prosecuted for printing Risen's articles. All right, the, uh, the second update I've got for you it refers to the case of Caitlin Hunt. She's the 18-year-old high school senior who's facing felony charges uh, with a possible 15-year term in prison over a same-sex relationship with a 15-year-old classmate. Prosecutors had offered her what they called an extremely generous o- deal under which she would have been labeled a sex offender and would have been under house arrest for two years. The update is that deal has been refused. Hunt's lawyer, whose name is Julia Graves, said, and I'm quoting, if this case involved a boy and a girl, there would be no media attention to this case. If this incident occurred 108 days earlier when Caitlin was 17, we wouldn't even be here. Now, there are those who are claiming that homophobia is not a driving force in this case, despite the rarity with which prosecutions ever occur over high school sex. But those people cite two cases in which a teenage boy was successfully prosecuted for having sex with a, lower, with, a, with a younger girl. Unfortunately for those folks, both of those cases involved a black boy and a white girl, which seems to re-raise the very question of bigotry which they hope to dismiss in the first place. All right, enough of that. For the rest of the show, I'm going to be talking about something else, something else. Of course, this past weekend, Memorial Day weekend, uh, and uh, which was the semi-official start, if not the actual astronomical start, the semi-official start of summer. And of course, as always, weekend was festooned with flags and bunting and celebrations of things military and effusive expressions of thanks to all our men and women in uniform linked to declarations of patriotism that seem invariably to revolve around swirling flags and martial music. Well, I want to raise a dissenting voice. I want to talk about patriotism. Now, when I've talked or written about this subject before, 
I've always noted at the beginning that uh, I know that no matter what I say or how I try to say it, it will be misunderstood by some and deliberately twisted by others, and I have never been disappointed in that expectation. But I'm going to say it here again anyway. I will try to be as clear as I can, knowing in advance that for some people, I will fail. But to start, I'm not a patriot. Although I actually have to amend that immediately. Uh, I'm not a patriot in the shallow sense in which the term is usually understood. I don't wear a flag pin. I don't put my hand over my heart during the national anthem, which, by the way, I was taught as a child is something that some people do but isn't required. Uh, I don't sing along with the national anthem. In fact, I don't even stand up for the national anthem. And I don't celebrate soldiers. Nor do I, as Barack Obama once called on us to do, quoting, always express our profound gratitude for the service of our men and women in uniform, period, thus exempting those folks from any and all moral judgment. Now, I can and I do celebrate individual soldiers, but not soldiers as a category. As I've said and written many times, soldiers are not heroes. They can be heroes. They can act heroically. They can do heroic things. But the act of putting on a uniform does not make you a hero, and it does not make you or your life any more worthy of respect or honor than anybody else's. Joseph Darby, the soldier who revealed the abuses at Abu Ghraib, uh, he was a hero. The soldiers in his unit, who in response to this, threatened him to the point that he had to be shipped home early for his own safety, they're not. Bradley Manning, the man who revealed war crimes committed by U.S. troops uh, in Iraq, is a hero. The soldiers who committed those war crimes, such as those in the video Collateral Murder, look it up, they're not. So I say again, I'm not a patriot. Except I am. Let me explain. The point is patriotism that consists in that it's measured in terms of wearing flag pins, singing the national anthem and the like is worthless and even dangerous. It's a shallow, a hollow patriotism. One, it's a shell that prefers form to substance and as we've seen all too often easily slides from patriotism into jingoism. If, as someone said, uh, someone said a while back, that patriotism requires no defense or apologies, neither should it require overt expression. And by the way, to try to head off some of that misunderstanding, um, which I expect I, I know will happen anyway, don't try to say that I said wearing a flag pin is hollow. I didn't. I said wearing a flag pin, I said a patriotism measured in terms of like wearing a flag pin rather than a deeper commitment is hollow. And it is. That, of course, raises the idea of what I mean by you know, a deeper commitment. What, 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 do I, or what do I mean by that term? Well, first, saying that such a commitment consists of a commitment to flag and country is meaningless. It's empty. It's the, it's the vapid patriotism of bumper stickers and needlepoint homilies. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, saying it's based on the supposed fact that this is the greatest country in the world is absurd unless you want to tell me what's the seventh greatest country in the world. What's the 18th greatest country? What's the 63rd greatest country in the world? Because to say this is the greatest country in the world, you have to have some objective standard by which nations can be judged and ranked. And frankly, I can't imagine what such a standard would be. Not when on so many social measures like poverty, child poverty, access to health care, and so many others that we are embarrassingly low. And even on some of our proudest achievements, such as the Bill of Rights, we're losing ground. And a patriotism based on calling out Stephen Decatur's famous line, my country right or wrong is downright dangerous. That is, of course, unless you want to amend it to the version of then-Senator Carl Schurz, who said in the 1870s, quoting, our dignity, our free institutions, and the peace and welfare of this and coming generations of Americans will be secure only as we cling to the watchword of true patriotism, our country when right to be kept right, when wrong to be put right. By the way, look up Carl Schurz, interesting guy. And his quote about true patriotism points toward my own commitments. Uh, 
Now, in addition to bracing the comment I read some years ago that it's natural to have an abiding affection for the land of one's birth, I say being a U.S. patriot means being dedicated to the ideals on which the country was supposedly founded and which, at its best moments, it has strived to achieve in as full a manner as it can. Ideals such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as the right to rebellion against oppression, as promoting the general welfare, as political freedoms, as representative government, uh, government of, by, and for the people. The ideal of, to sum it up in a single phrase, to the intent to establish justice. A justice that I say must include the social and economic as well as the political, if it's to have any real meaning. Patriotism means embracing those ideals. It means striving to hold this country to the highest of those ideals instead of to the lowest of its prejudices, the highest of its hopes, as opposed to the lowest of its fears. It's committing to a notion of what the U.S., of what we as a people can be and have at times approached being. Patriotism, that is, lies into the devotion to the ideals, not to any symbolic outward expression of it. Much more patriotism does not lie in support for or opposition to any particular administration or policy except as that support or opposition reflects a commitment to those ideals. Someone who during the Bush administration, for example, who opposed the Iraq war and was angered by Bush's usurpation of power was more patriotic than the war supporters who called Bush the commander in chief like we were supposed to obey orders like soldiers rather than exercise our duty as a free people to question authority. Someone during the Obama administration who denounces his unprecedented attacks on whistleblowers and is outraged by his mad claim that he can on his own authority have Americans assassinated without trial or charge is more patriotic than the Obama bots who stand silent in the face of his drone war and are apparently incapable of seeing the very real difference between dissent based on political disagreement and dissent based on racism. So on that basis, on that understanding of patriotism, I submit to you that I am as patriotic as they come. And I have neither patience with nor tolerance for those who would make patriotism a matter of gestures and decorations rather than of conviction. And I have even less patience and less tolerance with those who would try to prove their patriotism by impugning mine. I am not a patriot except that I am. So we're going to wrap up there. Uh, just going to leave with our weekly reminder. Leave you with our weekly reminder. As of May 28th, 4,437 Americans have been killed by gunfire in the United States since Newtown. 38 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you possibly can. We will see you next week. And... Um, We'll see you.